Welcome to Oklahoma Gardening. On today's program, host Casey Hinches takes a look at a beautiful grass that is lighting up our garden. We plant several varieties of garlic in our pallet bed. Barbara Brown has advice on using and storing the garlic after it has been harvested. And Casey installs decomposed granite around the beds in our concepts garden. Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance is provided by TLC, Oklahoma's leading garden center, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, Tulsa's source for great gardens, southwoodgardencenter.com. helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Ornamental grasses are some of the most low maintenance plants that you can add to your garden. There's no major disease or pest problems. A lot of them are drought tolerant and you can see they come in a range of sizes as well as colors. In late summer, early fall, there's one in particular that's really showing off. This is Muhlenbergia capillaris, also known as pink muley grass. And I think you can see how it gets its name from this pink cloud of flowers that it forms above its blades. It typically gets to be about three to four feet tall and about three feet wide. And you could plant it by, your, by itself, or you could also plant it as a large clump. It really looks good in mass if you have the room to do that. Now, typically throughout the season, it's not really noticed. It has kind of spiky, um, dull green, nothing really remarkable about it in the landscape until late summer, early fall, and it puts on this show. It's a great plant to extend your gardening season. we often think about planting bulbs and while we might typically be thinking about spring bulbs it's also a great time to start planting our garlic and garlic there's a lot of different varieties you can select here we have German red which has a red skin as well as Enchilium red which is a larger bulb these as well as Spanish Roja are great varieties for Oklahoma we've tried a couple of other ones that uh, we have music here and you can see this has a bit of a stronger neck to it and this is what is referred to as a hard neck garlic some are also called soft necks and it really doesn't matter which ones you have um, they're all kind of treated the same soft necks tend to last a little bit longer in storage than the hard necks but it's just what your preference is now this is an elephant garlic and you can see it's a bigger bulb and it actually only has uh, two cloves. Usually they don't have quite as many cloves. And this is not a true garlic at all. It's actually closely related to the leek family but has a mild garlic flavor to it. So you wanna keep the bulb intact until you're ready to plant it. And when you are ready to plant it, then we're gonna break apart each one of these uh, cloves because we'll plant each of these cloves independently from one another. Um, and each one of these will then go on to develop a new bulb for us. So out of this one bulb, we're actually gonna be getting four more plants next season. Now, when you look to plant, you're gonna want some loose, rich soil. Um, but garlic isn't too picky, but you do wanna have nice soil for it to grow in. And right now at this point, what we're gonna to wanna to encourage growth is on the roots. And so we're gonna add a little uh, phosphorus. We're just gonna to top dress with some phosphorus here and then we will work that in as we plant it with our hand trowel and we want to make sure that that uh, bone mill is getting down into that soil profile where those bulbs will be growing because phosphorus doesn't move in the soil profile too much so now that we have that worked in we're going to kind of level out our soil a little bit more there 
And we're gonna use this tool that is called a dibble. And this is nice to make easy holes into your soil. And we're gonna plant these about four to six inches apart and about four inches deep. Typically on bulbs, you wanna plant them twice the diameter, uh, the depth. So here you can see our bulb is about an inch and a half. So we're gonna plant it about four inches deep. Now, the important thing is, is when you're planting this, you wanna make sure all bulbs have a flat side to it. And you wanna make sure this is oriented down to the bottom, because this is where the roots are gonna grow and the point is where the foliage will grow. Now, it doesn't matter which type of garlic you grow, um, you're gonna plant all of these in the same way. If you have the elephant garlic, which tends to be bigger bulbs, you will want them side on the side of six inches between those bulbs because they will grow larger bulbs in next season. The other thing you wanna think about is when you're looking at your bulbs and all the cloves, there's different sizes of those cloves. Typically the outside cloves tend to be a little bit larger and those are the ones that you're going to want to plant. The ones that are inside tend to be a little bit smaller. Those will make smaller bulbs next year. So if you wanna try the flavor of these bulbs this year, those are the ones you wanna take into the kitchen. Now, elephant garlic, like I said, it makes a very large bulb. So these you're gonna to wanna to plant a full six inches apart between the bulbs so that they have plenty of room to develop. You want to make sure that you label all of your garlic because you likely won't see much growth before winter. The bulk of the growth is going to come next spring. And before we're finished here, we want to put some mulch on it. We've just got some pine fines. We're going to put a couple of inches that will help keep it over the winter. Next spring, we'll start to see some of that growth come up and then we'll be able to harvest in June. Garlic, it's an easy plant and great to plant this time of year because you can get ahead of the schedule. Today we're going to talk about garlic and I'm going to try to clear up some of the terminology associated with it. So we'll start with the intact piece. This is either a head of garlic or it's sometimes called a bulb. Either one is the same. Uh, and when you break off one piece, uh, if I can do that here, this becomes just the clove of garlic. So most of the time when we're talking about recipes, they're talking about these, not those. You buy them in that form, uh, but you use them in this form. So that's just to start it off. Then I wanted to talk about some of the different kinds of garlic. Most of the time when you go to the grocery store, you're gonna find soft neck garlic, which is what you have here. You can see that there's not a hard core in the middle of it anywhere. It's the most common kind in the supermarket. Also lots and lots of cloves in there so that uh, you buy one uh, head of garlic and you have lots of cloves for many recipes. This is a hard neck version and you can see that right in the center, uh, there is a, a hard stem that came through. Uh, fewer cloves. It's also got a sharper taste. Some people prefer this. Uh, it's got a lot more bite to it than this one will. Uh, and then this one is elephant garlic and you can see why that probably got its name because they look like they're on steroids and they're, they're much larger. And it's actually fallen apart. And then you can see here this would be the stem that would be found in the center. Um, these have a very, very mild flavor in part because it's not really garlic. Uh, it's uh, related to, the, it's in the leek family as opposed to in the garlic family. Uh, so it's got a little bit of a hint of onion in it when you use it. So uh, they're fun if you don't want to peel a lot of garlic. Uh, you can use them, but expect it to have a very mild flavor when you're using it. How you store them, uh, all of them will be stored the same way. None of them ever, ever, ever should see the inside of your refrigerator um, because uh, that will cause them to uh, deteriorate much quicker. So cool, dry, and dark. Uh, you can put them in a brown paper bag. You can use one of those little clay pots uh, that are made for garlic. Those work well, uh, but don't refrigerate them. It also changes the flavor on them, uh, can make them more uh, sharp. 
The other thing that you don't want to do uh, that I tend to do here when I'm doing a show is prep them too early because the longer they sit, the more enzymes uh, that are going to activate some of the chemicals within the garlic itself and it's going to in, expand the flavor and make it sharper and sharper. So uh, room temperature, prep it at the end right before you need it. Um, make sure that the, the bulbs are firm when you buy them, not soft. Now let's look at a couple of ways that you can prep them. Uh, one of the ways that's really common uh, is roasting. And if you haven't done this, I encourage you to do so because it really mellows out the flavor. Anytime the garlic gets up to at least 140 degrees, the enzymes are destroyed and the, the sharp flavors begin to disappear. Uh, so you uh, get something that's got a lot of a more softness to it. So the first thing you want to do if you want to roast it is to, well, preheat your oven somewhere between 350 to 400. So you can do it when you're doing something else. Uh, uh, and then there's this paper uh, wrapping or paper coating peel that you want to take off the garlic as you go around it. Then you want to expose the cloves themselves. So set it down and cut at least a quarter of an inch so you can get as many of the, the cloves exposed as possible. And then you have several options. You could do them one at a time. You could fill up a pie plate with them. I'm going to use three. My oven's preheating. Uh, so we're going to put them in foil. Now if you're doing one at a time, you do it exactly the same way. You're going to put some oil in here. Be generous with the oil because we want it to, uh, uh, it helps cook it while it's in the oven too. So drizzle it around so that it coats the cloves and kind of drips down the sides. This is so easy. You're going to be amazed. And, and the flavor is so great. Now we're simply going to wrap this together and wrap it up in the foil nice and snug. You can do it fancier, but this works just as well. Uh, then I usually put it in a pie plate, simply because if something breaks open, I don't want to find it at the bottom of my oven. It kind of protects it a little bit. Now, you could have put a little bit of oil in this pan, filled that pan with garlic heads uh, with the little tops cut off, and then covered that with foil. This is then going to go in the oven, uh, and it's going to go in there. The time is going to vary. Uh, in part because it depends on how much you have, what variety you have, how your oven is calibrated. Usually somewhere between 40 to 50 minutes, 40 minutes to an hour. Uh, you can open it from time to time and look and see if it's browning. What we want to have happen is we want it to get nice and soft. This one was cooked ahead. So it's nice and soft and it's got a little bit of, of brownness going on it as well. So how do you use that? Well, you can do it with several ways. If you have a soup or a stew that you think needs a little bit more flavor to it, uh, you can uh, take that and uh, squeeze out one or two cloves and just stir them in the soup. These are nice and soft now, so they'll blend in and smooth, uh, the, uh, disappear in that soup or stew really quickly. And it's a nice way to add some depth of flavor that you might not get otherwise if you're making a quick soup. Or if you're trying to take a soup that you got uh, already made from somewhere else and you're trying to make it your own, another way to do it also. Now these, you're just going to squeeze them out of here and then they can be spread on bread. Also, this is the same way you get them out if you want to uh, use them on something else. If, in general, if you're going to do this uh, and have uh, spread on bread, estimate that each person's going to need somewhere between a half to a whole head of garlic, and that way they uh, have plenty of uh, garlic to work with. This one probably needs a little bit more. You could drizzle a little bit more on this. You could put it on, on uh, bread that's already been toasted, uh, or you can make garlic bread really easily as well. So there's a lot of ways to do it uh, that can give you a lot of flavor, and it's a lot better than if you go with something like this. Now, this is already peeled, all ready to go. Uh, you don't want to do this yourself at home, uh, particularly if you're using it in oil. You never leave a garlic and oil mixture at room temperature because it becomes a situation where you have a low acid food now in an anaerobic situation uh, without oxygen. And if, if those two things going together can result in botulism toxin and, and they're having you know, cases of botulism poisoning as a result of garlic in oil mixtures. If you do want to do that, you can do it. Uh, use it very quickly. Store it in the refrigerator. You can also store it in the freezer uh, and then just break off bits when you want. One of the reasons these, these kinds of products are used is because they are very convenient. Uh, if, however, you uh, are using a recipe, um, you saw the different size of cloves here. Uh, if it tells you one clove, well, one clove of elephant garlic or even a large clo a clove of uh, some other kinds of garlic, so you kind of don't know where you are. So it, what it really means when it says one clove is one teaspoon if it's chopped, half a teaspoon if it's minced. 
Once you know these garlic basics, you can really go out there and explore the world of garlic. All the different varieties have a little bit of different flavors. So if you're drawing, growing them in your own garden, you've got some real challenges of uh, tasting and some fun exploring what you're going to have when you're done. For Oklahoma Gardening, I'm Barbara Brown. Have you seen this material? It's being used a lot more in landscape designs. It's called DG or decomposed granite and basically it's just crushed up solid chunks of granite. It varies in color depending on your supplier's quarry and where they get it from. There's a lot of applications to this and a lot of people have asked about the pros and cons of it. Now you want to make sure that you're putting it in a fairly flat location because it can wash out. You wouldn't want to use it in a spot that has a lot of runoff or say under the eave of a house that might not have gutters because it will wash out quite a bit. The other thing is this isn't really appropriate to put up near your house. It tends to get on your shoes and if you track it into the house it's not the best thing, uh, especially on hardwood floors that can really scratch up those floors. We've chosen to install it here in our concept garden because we are looking at a flat space. A few months ago we started this project and you don't have to take that long but we looked at really wanting to remove this Bermuda grass and depending on your timeline and also your patience will help kind of play into the timeline to install DEG. So we needed to identify our boundary. Uh, we didn't want to have any spaces that were small that we needed to weed eat or get a mower in or anything. So we looked at starting over on our west entrance of our concept garden and we put a curve along the front of these smaller containers all the way to our south entrance of our concept garden. This ties these gardens together and it makes a nice contrast between the vegetation and the DG. Here we're using just natural DG which is just simply the aggregate. There is also DG with a stabilizer and basically that's a binding agent that's mixed in with the DG and you could use that on areas that you might get a little more traffic such as paths or something that has a little bit more slope to it. It'll help stabilize that a little bit more. There is also a DG that has a resin in it and this is going to bind those particles together even more. It still allows for a porous surface so the water will drain through it not quite as well as just your natural DG, but it's a great DG to choose if you're using it for a driveway or something that really needs to be stabilized even more. We used a regular garden hose to help define our curve, and a garden hose is a great way to kind of play with the shape a little bit. Again, we decided on using a nice gentle curve because it's easier to get a mower in here instead of having to work with any right angles. Now after you have your curve designed and you're happy with those lines, what you're going to want to do is pick up that garden hose and as you do that, spray paint that line. Once you have the garden hose safely removed so that you don't have to ruin it, you're going to bring in the sod cutter and remove the sod in the space where you want the DG to be. After we've got the sod removed, we're still going to need to spray that Bermuda grass. We gave ours a couple of months and it continued to grow back and so we sprayed it about three times with glyphosate over the time period. Again, depending on your own timeline, you can speed up that process and or not spray as often depending on your preference. After we have that done, and you can see now that our sod is removed, we're going to install our metal edging. Now this is the typical edging that we use here at the studio gardens, but if you wanted to use a paver or a decorative stone or brick, you could do that and it would give a little fancier look to your DG patio. This edging is really nice because it's simple to install and you get about seven linear feet of bed edging in one piece. Now it does come in links and it actually has short stakes that are attached to it that we've broken off here. If you want a longer stake, you're going to have to buy that separately. And these longer stakes are nice just to really uh, stabilize that bed edging as it comes in. As I said, these little pieces are locked in here and they break off simply uh, and pretty easy with some pliers. And the reason why you're going to need to break those off is because they interlock. And this, again, is what keeps your bed edging solid throughout the whole length of the bed edge. 
What you'll do is just install these stakes and we're following our turf because we've already got our line determined and you're going to hammer these down in. You can see that that locks those pieces together. And the nice thing about this edging is that every two feet, about two feet, you have these holes, these slats, where you put these stakes through it. And you don't have to do them all right away, but it gives you a little bit more flexibility if you need to hold certain curves. Um, we're just gonna kinda do every other one initially and then come back. You always wanna make sure that you come back and do put stakes in every one of the holes and that just ensures and reinforces it a little bit more. So now that we've reached the end, what we're gonna do is grab one of our pieces here and obviously it's too long, but we're gonna go ahead and measure how much of that length we need and then cut it off with the Sawzall. So you can see here, we've got some drip irrigation that we don't want to use, uh, we don't want to encroach on. So we're going to cut it right about here. So we've got our last piece secured in and we just want to go ahead and finish that. But I wanted to show you a couple other pieces that you can get also. So on our cut edge, sometimes that can be rough or a little bit sharp. And this is a nice finished piece that you can get that will just stake over that last piece and finish it off. If we had bed edging along the back that we needed, then there's also angled pieces that you could get that cover both ends this way. But for this, we're just gonna use this piece right here and that's all we need to do to finish our edging. Now there might be some other pieces other than a mallet you might need and this bed edger was a really nice piece of equipment to cut that groove to put your edge, your metal edging in. The other thing is this bed edging is about a four inch height on it. Now if we were doing this where it backed up to a flower bed, we wouldn't be as concerned about the height here. In fact, it would be nice to have that edge to weed eat against. But because we're looking at doing a space behind this edging where people are going to walk, we want to make sure that it's low enough that there's not a tripping hazard. But at the same time, we want to keep a little bit of a lip to it so that the Bermuda grass doesn't quickly just grow over it. Now, if you're finding that your bed edge is a little high in spots, here's a little trick. You can get a piece of two by four or two by six and then your mallet and hammer it down in some of those locations and slowly work some of those high spots down. For the next step, we're gonna need some landscape fabric and the heavier, the thicker the material you can get, the better off you'll be. You'll also need some landscape stakes and these just will act as staples to staple it in the ground. And you can see here, we've got it all completed now. And so because this is a light traffic situation, we're gonna just start applying the DG. But if it was a heavier traffic path or even a driveway, you'd wanna put a nice base of gravel down first. But again, since this is just a light area, we're gonna go ahead and start adding the DG. You want to put the first layer down about an inch and an inch and a half thick and as you go along you want to moisten it a little bit. It's almost like the texture and the consistency of brown sugar if you will. And so as you do this you want to compact it and that moisture in there will help kind of interlock it a little bit more. Uh, depending on your timeline and your situation it is best to give it a few hours to kind of solidify and bake some of that moisture out and then come back with another couple of inches and compact it once more. You can see here the area that we're doing is quite large so we've actually rented a compactor. Now if you're doing a smaller location you might want to just get a hand tamper and those work just as fine. They just might wear you out a little bit if you're doing a large space like this. Now that we've installed the final layer, we really want to make sure the top of this is smooth. And you can do this a couple of ways. You can just use a hand rake to rake it smooth, or you can also get a piece of chain link fence and drag that behind you, kind of like what they do on baseball fields to smooth out that gravel. 
That usually works best in large open spaces though. After we've got this all smoothed out and brought up to grade, really the only maintenance that's required is occasional weeding. And again, you can do that by hand or you can spray it out. And then the other thing is as time goes on, you'll notice low spots, but it's nice to keep a pile of DG over off to the side to fill that in. You might just need to do a little top dressing occasionally. Other than that, this is a great low cost solution for creating a nice patio. Next week on Oklahoma Gardening, we transition our tropicals to come inside. Casey has bulbs for spring color, and we take the pain out of handling cacti. Join us then for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, TLC Garden Centers, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society. We hope you enjoyed this video. It's part of our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. You can also find even more videos on our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel. And join us on social media for great gardening tips, photos, and discussion.